But we will have some question answer time. And so feel free to uh, stock up those questions in preparation for that time. Um, at what point, how many minutes into the presentation do we want to look at those questions? Uh, so you have a total of 75 minutes. Uh, so mm -hmm. we were thinking 60 minutes of your session and then the last 15 minutes for question Q&A. All right, excellent. That works really well for me. And so let's make a start. So welcome to this topic on Power BI paginated reports. I won't spend a lot of time talking about myself because the introduction has already happened. But here I am today in uh, my home city of Melbourne, Australia. And, um, and uh, looking forward to presenting to you on one of my favorite Power BI topics which is paginated reports. So I'm going to introduce what paginated reports are. I'll introduce then the design experience and I'll spend good time really in demonstration, showing you a practical example of how to build up a paginated report. And uh, that will give me the opportunity to introduce many of the key capabilities and why this topic makes me so excited when it comes to delivering my data in report form. We'll take a look then at the user experience and then we will recap many of the key points by reminding you about why you might choose paginated reports. For those that have investments already in SQL Server reporting services, we'll discuss the potential for migration to Power BI, and then we'll wrap up with resources and an opportunity for questions. All right, well, let's begin at the very beginning with what are paginated reports? So they are reports available to you in Power BI that are optimized for printing or PDF generation. So the word paginated should be a very strong clue, as in the report is optimized for formatting to page and potentially multiple pages. They provide you with the ability to produce highly formatted and what we refer to as pixel perfect layout. And when you see me in demonstration, you'll better understand the degree of control we have for precisely laying out our data in the way that we expect. Now, if you already have background with SQL Server reporting services, and a little bit of history there is that this reporting capability was first delivered with SQL Server 2000. That was actually in the year 2004. So this is a report design option we've had for over 16 years. But when we refer to paginated reports in Power BI, it really is the evolution beyond SQL Server reporting services that you may already uh, work with and love. All right, so specifically in reporting services, we're talking about RDL reports. And RDL as an acronym stands for Report Definition Language. What we'll find is that paginated reports are a good choice when it comes to delivering operational style reports. And uh, they are developed by using a dedicated tool. So it's not Power BI Desktop. You will download at no cost a different report authoring tool known as Power BI Report Builder. All right, now to compare them with Power BI reports, these reports are developed in Power BI Desktop and they emphasize a very different set of capabilities. They are optimized for exploring and interaction. And I think at last count, when I looked at all of the potential interaction capabilities that Power BI reports support, whether it's slices or page navigation or sorting, spotlighting, cross filtering, highlighting, you know, the whole concept of a Power BI report is to enable the user to discover deeper meaning within data. All right. So it's a good choice when you need your users to explore and discover relationships and patterns. So for this reason, we contrast the Power BI report uh, with the paginated report by describing it as an interactive analytic report. All right, so it's pixel perfect for paginated reports and it's interactive analytics reports for the Power BI reports. Now, nothing speaks better than a demonstration. So let's take a look at a Power BI app that I have here. And this app um, has a navigation pane. And uh, what I can point out to you here is that I'm currently on a report named the Sales Analysis Report. And I'm on the first page of that report, which is Sales Analysis. Now, it's a very simple Power BI report, enabling me to interact by changing the year, 
Uh, I can view some fairly modern visuals like a KPI and several cards. And I also have a combo column line chart. Now by hovering over some of the columns, I can see that tooltips reveal additional detail. Yet as an interaction, when I go ahead and select or even multi-select these columns, I'm achieving a cross filter on the page. Just one more example of interactivity. Now, this report has a second page known as the sales order, which is a little unusual, but let's take a look. And what we'll see on this page is that there is a sales order filtered to order number, and I want you to remember this order number, 51721. So at the AdventureWorks company, this order has in fact, and I'm scrolling down the table visual here, to reveal that it has 72 order lines. Okay, interesting. So what's going to happen then when I deliver this sales order to my customer because I would like to be paid for my services, but on the file menu here, I'm going to go ahead and print or let me export to PDF. And I want you to pay attention here that there are three options when it comes to exporting for um, Power BI report. It's PowerPoint, PDF, or you could analyze further in Excel. Now what I'm going to do is export to PDF. And that's going to generate a PDF representation of the Power BI report, and it will download it when the rendering is complete. This might take a few seconds, um, usually somewhere between 20 and 30 seconds, because what's happening is that on the Power BI service, the report's being rendered and literally it's taking image snapshots that it then embeds into a PDF document. And then it's going to download them here for me to view. All right, so a little bit of patience as this renders. And I'm hoping we're almost there, let's see. Okay, so now that the report is rendered and downloaded, I then open up my downloads folder. Let's take a look at the report. And uh, we can see that it doesn't want to open it. Let's try that again. Okay, so the first thing I want to point out here is that it has produced a two page PDF document. And I'll remind you that it actually is a snapshot image. So as try as I might, I'm clicking here on this download, and it's impossible for me to actually interact with the slicer. All right, so that's a downside of an interactive report being rendered as a PDF. Now, when I navigate to the second page, I see my sales order here. But the vertical scroll bar, is actually just an image. So it's impossible for me to see all of the order line details, knowing that there are 72 of them. So this is an unfortunate side effect of a Power BI report is that if you need to distribute it in a page format, like a PDF document, it's not going to work particularly well. Now to the rescue, in the very same app, I have another report named sales order. And this sales order is a Power BI paginated report. So it's going to present exactly the same information, filtering on the sales order, again, number 51721. And what I can already see here on the navigation pane is that I can navigate between potential multiple pages. In fact, if I scroll to the very end, I'll see that there are two of two pages. Now let's see what happens this time when I export, and I love this because paginated reports provide so many other options when it comes to exporting. All right, whether it's a Word format of Word document, PowerPoint, Excel, whether it's PDF or data formats like CSV or XML. Well, for a fair comparison, let me export this report to PDF and let's see how the result differs. So this time I see that I've got the sales order report. And interestingly, we can see that it's a three page report. All right. And I can scroll down 
and I can see things like page footer for page one, the continuation of the line orders to page two, and notice the way that the header, including details and the company logo, continue at the top of each page. And then finally, I arrive at the third page, whereupon I see grand totals. All right, so this to me is one of the best demonstrations that compares or contrasts the difference between a Power BI report emphasizing interaction and the paginated report that is designed for pixel perfect layout and for printing potentially across multiple pages. Now, a word about licensing. I like to have this conversation up front. All right, so already I've mentioned that there's a different report authoring tool known as Power BI Report Builder, and that's freely available for you to download at no cost. I'll demonstrate how I can work with Power BI Report Builder. You can use it to design reports. You can use it to preview and even export reports. But the intention of this tool is that ultimately you will publish it to the Power BI service, whereupon reports are accessible through the Power BI service web portal. Now, there's two stories, and the timing for this presentation is very, very good because there's some new news. First of all, the current licensing works like this. The paginated reports in the Power BI service will only render when those reports are in a workspace, and that workspace is on a dedicated capacity that is a premium capacity and that it has a particular workload enabled. That workload is the paginated reports workload. So that means that a capacity administrator needs to enable the uh, paginated reports and thereupon paginated reports can be rendered. So this will require some money. You'll need a Power BI uh, premium subscription to support that workload capability. In addition, if you're going to author paginated reports and publish them to a workspace, you will need a Power BI Pro license to do so. Okay. Now that's the current story and the exciting news is because I have a number of customers and they're a little concerned by this because the premium license uh, cost is, is beyond their budget. And so as much as they would love the capability of these paginated reports, unfortunately, uh, they can't work with them in the service because of the licensing cost. Now, to address that, Microsoft have made a recent announcement. And that announcement is about premium per user or PPU. All right, so stay tuned. I'm going to go through it in a little more detail at the end of the presentation. And I have a great resource that answers many common questions that you might have about this new license. Now, to be fair, this new license isn't available yet. And the, the discussion is that it might go into preview uh, in November this year. All right, so from a licensing perspective, you will need additional licensing. Currently with premium, uh, in the future, maybe premium per user will support the ability to deliver paginated reports. All right, well, nothing speaks better, I think, once you know what a paginated report is, to actually work through a comprehensive demonstration and therefore introduce to you the features and capabilities supported by paginated reports. So I'm going to introduce Report Builder, the all important topic of how your reports can retrieve data and then present that through data visualizations. There's also um, one of my favorite topics in paginated reports is to do with parameterization. There are in fact two types of parameterization being query parameters and report parameters and I'll cover off on both of those. Uh, we'll take a brief look at interactivity and then we'll finish the entire development cycle by publishing the paginated report to the service. All right, so it all begins with reminding ourselves about the need to deliver a sales order. And we're going to focus on the order 51721. So I've already pre-installed Power BI Report Builder. So it's simply a matter of clicking on my taskbar shortcut, whereupon it opens up Report Builder. And then I'm going to point out to you that we have this getting started window. Now you can dismiss it. Uh, but I find that it's helpful to either open a recently um, edited report or to quick start uh, a new report development. To accelerate your development, I'm highlighting here the potential for you to kickstart your report design by engaging with a wizard. There's a wizard for creating a table or a matrix, and you'll learn that they are grid representations of your data. Um, there's a chart wizard for data visualization graphically or a map wizard to support the configuration of um, spatial representation of your data. Now, 
Wizards are great as a learning tool, but they're not going to allow me to describe a lot of the intricacies and detail that I want you to understand about paginated report design. So I'm going to be working with the blank report layout. So I simply select that option and here I find myself in Report Builder ready to design this report. Now I want you to notice across the very top that this is an untitled report. So the first thing I recommend you do, come to the File ribbon tab and I'm going to do a Save As and I have two options for saving. Am I saving it locally to my PC or am I publishing it to the Power BI service? Well, when I'm developing, I want the local file to be with me. And when I'm ready, I'm going to publish that file to the service itself. All right, so I click Save As and I'm going to save to my PC and I have a demo folder and I'm going to save this as the sales order and I'm going to call this something like sales order demo. And therefore, what we can see is that I'm developing a document. Here we go. That is the sales order demo .rdl. RDL, of course, is report definition language. All right, so let me introduce you to Report Builder. Very, very similar to Office products, we have a ribbon across the top and I'm highlighting it here and we can switch between the ribbon tabs of Home, Insert and View. At the left hand side is the report data pane. Now for the particular report that I'm developing, this is where I can manage resources like parameters, images, data sets and data connections. So a lot of my configuration is done here in preparation for what the report will need. Now, along the bottom, you'll find that there are a couple of panes, including row groups and column groups. These panes here are dedicated for managing Tablix visualizations. And I'll introduce the Tablix shortly, but if you're looking for grid layout of your data through a table with fixed columns or a matrix that achieves grouping on columns and rows, this is where we can see and configure the grouping properties. Now, at the very bottom right corner, you're going to find several helpful shortcut tools. So for zooming, you've got the uh, zoom slider and to the left of it, where I'm highlighting now, you've got the ability to toggle between design view and the uh, preview. And this helps you and you'll find in report development, you're constantly switching between design and preview, design preview, design preview, ultimately arriving at what is that pixel perfect result at the very end. But wait, there's more. When I come to the View ribbon tab, you'll see that I can enable a couple of other panes, the properties and the parameters. So notice here on the right hand side, I have the properties pane. This exposes to us all of the properties of any selected element in the report designer. The selected element you can see here at the very top left. It is the report itself that is currently selected. And so for that selected element, you can re review the properties or modify them. Okay, now sometimes, as I'm highlighting here, there might be a property page, which means you don't need to use this complex pane. There is a user interface window that allows you to configure common properties for the selected object type. Now, the last thing to point out to you is the parameters pane. So the parameters here are used to prompt your report users for values whether those values are used for filtering of data or other purposes. This pane allows you to customize the layout using columns and rows to come up with exactly what you would like for your users to interact with. All right, so the last thing to draw your attention to, and I'm highlighting it here now, is the report designer itself. This is the template of the blank report. And so to be very clear about this, I'm going to introduce you to the fact that there are two regions here. I want you to notice that there's this line separating the report body from the report footer. Okay, so the blank template has a body, it has a footer, and then within those, we'll see that there are some text boxes. The text box in the body is prompting me to enter a report title, whereas the page footer already has a text box that is returning the execution time of the report. 
Now, the very first thing I do when developing a paginated report is give consideration to how it is going to be rendered and delivered. If it is going to be printed, then I must take great care to configure the properties that define the page size and orientation, including any margins. So for the report itself, what I'm going to do up here in the properties pane is I'm going to open up the property window for the report itself. And we can see here then for the page setup that this is where I can control the page units. Now it defaults to my regional settings. I'm using US settings here. So I'm going to switch them to become centimeters. And then from a paper size point of view, I'm going to select A4. I notice that the width and height are automatically set according to the dimensions of that, that known paper size. And I'm happy with portrait and my next consideration of the margins, which I think the default of 2.54 centimeters, which originally was one inch, is way too generous. So I'm going to reduce them all to one centimeter, thereby providing much more real estate and space on the page for my data. Now, we need to do a little bit of um, arithmetic. If the width of an A4 piece of paper is 21 centimeters and the margins at the right and left are each one centimeter, 21 minus one minus one means that I have 19 centimeters width in my report body. Okay, so the next thing I do when I accept these properties, and I want you to notice how that window just updated the properties here for the report, is that I select the body and notice the way that the body properties are now available to me. And then I expand the size properties and I ensure that the width is 19, all right? And during my report development, I do not want to make that wider than 19 because it will then overflow to multiple pages and produce not a great result. What I will do is reposition the text box that I see in the page footer so it will be at the very bottom right corner of the page. I'll now enter into the first text box the title of the report, which is going to be the sales order. By the way, I'm constantly pressing Control S so that I'm saving my efforts and protecting the work that I'm doing. Now, we haven't done a lot, really. We've just changed some properties of the report and the width itself. But what I will do on the home ribbon, I'm going to switch to the preview and I can do that here, or remember, I could also do it in the bottom right corner. Where was I? Bottom right corner down here would allow me to switch between preview and design. The reason that I'm doing this is I want to look at what the page looks like so far. Now, what I'm seeing is an HTML rendering, but what I prefer to do is to switch on the print layout so I can see what it would look like if it were to be printed to a piece of paper. And when I do this, I can then see how the title appears at the very top left and my execution time at the bottom right. So far, everything looks good. So I switch back to design. And my next consideration on the insert ribbon tab is that I want a header for this report. You see, at the moment, the text box that contains the sales order header will only show on the first page because that text box is in the body of the report. Because I want it to repeat on every page, I then add a header and then I drag that text box to the top left of the header itself. Now, while I'm here, I'm going to provide um, uh, or I'm going to embed the company logo. So that repeats at the top right corner. And I can do that on the ribbon by using the report items. So I'll point out to you that a text box is a great way of conveying text data. An image lets you embed an image into the report or it could be retrieved dynamically from your data store. A line is just that. If you want some line, whether it's diagonal or vertical or horizontal, and then a rectangle could just be a shape that provides visual interest or it's also a container, whereupon you can add other report elements into the rectangle, and that rectangle then provides ease of moving around. All right, I'm going to add an image. The way that I prefer to do this, by the way, is just right-click in the header and then use the context menu to insert an image. 
All right, as I pointed out, images could be retrieved through a web URL, they could be embedded as I'll do now, or they could be retrieved via a query from a database. So using embedded, I'll simply import the logo from my file system. And that literally embeds the image into my RDL document. And then I reposition it to the top left and I'll resize it as such. Now I'm now guaranteed, as we'll see, that the company logo will appear in the top right corner of every page of this report. All right, I think I'm ready to now start retrieving some data to present in this report. So in the report data pane, this is where I first perform a connection by adding a data source. Now I want you to pay attention to the two options that you have. The first one is that you can connect to a data set that exists in the, in the Power BI workspace. That would mean that you would create a query to query the data set that would use the language of either DAX or MDX. Alternatively, you can connect directly to other supported data source types. Now, in fact, for the AdventureWorks company, their operational data for sales resides inside an Azure SQL database. So let's take a look then at the available connection types. In the cloud, we have the Azure SQL database. We also have the Azure Analysis Services and Azure Synapse Analytics, formerly known as the Azure SQL Data Warehouse. All right, there's the on-premises options as well, but it could be that you're working with SQL Server on-prem, Oracle, or Teradata, in which case you will need a data gateway set up so that the Power BI service can communicate with those data stores. By the way, there's also Analysis Services on-prem too. So I'm going to select the Microsoft Azure SQL database, and I'm going to build up a connection to that database. As it happens, I have a server name. I'm going to configure that it uses SQL authentication. I have an account name known as read-only user. It never requires any permissions beyond reading the data. And uh, then I go and enter a password and save that password. Next, I enter the database name and I test the connection. Having configured and successfully tested, when I click OK, that build window has copied in a valid connection string to connect to that database. The last thing that I'll do is rename the data source to something that's much easier to remember. It is the AdventureWorks DW2020 database. Now, watch what happens when I click OK, because we see then in the report data pane that I have my data source defined. The next step then is to define what we call a data set. So I right click the data source to add a data set. And the first thing that I want to say is that this is not the same concept as a data set that you'll find inside a Power BI workspace. The data set in a paginated report is in fact a command to retrieve data from a data source. And in fairness, reporting services since 2004 has reserved the use of this name, data set, for that purpose. So we have data sets in the Power BI service, we have data sets in paginated reports. You just need to be clear when communicating to people which one you mean. Now, a data set has a unique name, and I'm going to name this data set DS main. The main means that it's really my principal data store. And you'll see in this demo that I'll have reason shortly to actually create multiple data sets to support other functionality. Now, the next consideration for this relational source is that I can retrieve data through a text query, or I could execute a store procedure. And a store procedure is in fact a recommended practice in many circumstances if they're available and you have the skills to create them. If we use text, it's really just a matter of filling in a query here in the query box. You could use your favorite tool, maybe SQL Server Management Studio, to write a query, to test it, and then copy paste it into this window. Or perhaps you don't have the skills to write that query, in which case you have the support of a graphic query designer, which I'm going to launch right now. This provides a simple and quick way to build up a query. So within my AdventureWorks 2020 database, I'm going to take a look at all of the tables and I'll identify that it's the fact reseller sales. It's this table that has the information that is the order details. 
So I'm simply going to check the sales order line number. And then I understand that I want details about the reseller. So I'll introduce the reseller name from the DIM reseller table. And then from the DIM product table, I'll bring in the English product name. And then returning to the factory seller sales table, I'll introduce the order quantity, the unit price, and the sales amount. So effectively what I've done by checking those five columns is I've added them to the available fields list. And while I'm here, I'll also point out that you have the ability to group and aggregate, that you might do a group by and then summarize some columns in the results. Now for this sales order report, there's no need for grouping and aggregation. Next, I'm pointing out to you the icon that allows me to define an applied filter. So I'm going to put a filter on the sales order number. And specifically, I want to use the sales order number 51721. Remember, that was the order that has 72 order lines. Let me put it to the test and I can do that easily by using the menu to run the query. So I want you to notice that I didn't need to write anything here like a select statement. I didn't need to join tables or create where clauses. And here I can see a preview of the query result and I can verify, as I expect, that the order has 72 lines. Now, before I go any further, there is this very, very helpful checkbox. This checkbox for the applied filter allows me to surface that filter value as a report parameter, thereby enabling the report user to modify the value. So I'm simply going to check that checkbox. Now watch what happens when I click OK. A select statement is now copied into the data set query. And importantly, have a look at this where clause with a close attention to what we call a query parameter. That when this data set is executed, a value will be substituted into here to retrieve the order lines for that order. Now on page two of the data set properties, here on the left, we have the fields pane. So I'm going to go ahead, select fields, and we'll see that all of those columns are available here. Now, what I like to do is provide a more friendly and concise name for the field. So sales order line number is going to be easier if I just name it line. And the reseller name can just become the reseller. The English product name can just become product. And order quantity is quantity, unit price is price, and the sales amount is sales. So I'm simply providing a more friendly alias to each of those fields. Now I've completed the configuration of the data set. And before I click OK, I want to draw your attention to my report data pane specifically to here and to here. And I also want you to look in the parameter pane here because some magic and automatic behavior is about to happen. I'm clicking OK. I want you to now notice that I have a report parameter and it's also listed here in the parameters pane. And I have my data set DS main with six very friendly named fields. Let's take a look, first of all, at the report parameter. This was created automatically because in the where clause of the data set query, there was a query parameter. So when I open up the parameter properties, I see that it's got its unique name. Uh, we have a prompt. So I might choose to just make this a little more brief. It'll be named order number. The data type is text. I see that I could configure available values to present options in a drop-down list. We'll come back to this in a later part of the demo. And there's also a default value which will be applied automatically. And I would like you to notice that the value that I entered into the query designer has now become a default. This will work beautifully during my report design because as I move from design to preview and design preview, design preview, there are already values automatically there for testing. But I will make sure that before I publish this report to the service that that's the default that I'm likely to remove because um, that'll become an annoyance for most users to have an automatic report for that one order. So for now, I will leave the default where it is. All right, please notice then that inside my parameter pane, we have a nicely renamed parameter prompting for the order number. And let me go ahead and run the report now 
So you can see that it's defaulting to that sales order number. All right. Whenever you use a report parameter to filter data, it's highly recommended that you feed that value back so that it's displayed in the report itself. So what I'd like to see is that in the header of this report, I'd like to communicate the sales order number. And this is how I can do it. I right click inside the header of the report and I insert a text box. Let me just go and reposition it directly beneath the title and I also like to make it wider. Now I can click inside the text box and I can just start typing. Order number colon, and this is very powerful. We don't have this in Power BI reports, but the ability to right click and insert what is known as a placeholder. And the placeholder is just an expression that you can inject inside and inline within a text box. So I'm going to open up what is known as the expression editor that will determine the value that is displayed in the placeholder. And so here, inside the expression window, I can enter an expression using the language, which is vb.net. Now, this doesn't mean to be a paginated report author, you have to be an object-oriented developer. Although, if you have that background, it's very, very easy. Um, you'll find that many of the expressions you need to create are simplistic, not requiring you to be a proficient developer. Now, to support you in that, in the category list, I can then reveal to you that there are hundreds of functions and they're all categorized into these groups. So they make it somewhat easier for you to find and understand. And then if you choose, you'll see that there is a description and there are examples of use. Now, what I'm doing here is actually very simple. I want to show the value of the parameter. So I simply come to the parameters and I see that I have my sales order number parameter and then I double click it and you'll see that an expression referencing the value of the parameter is injected in. I don't need to do any more. I click OK and I click OK again. And now what we see is a text box that has some static text and a placeholder that will dynamically um, show the value of the report parameter. Now these text boxes are also uh, can be richly formatted. So I'm going to use the home ribbon to make the, uh, the static text bold. Let me just do one more example. I'm going to insert another text box because we'd like to know the name of the reseller. So what I'll do is I'll introduce the reseller with a placeholder. This time the expression won't be using a parameter. It will actually use a data set field. So from my DS main data set, I just double click the reference to the reseller field and automatically I have the expression I need to return that. Let me just format that reseller. And now let's preview the report to see what it looks like. All right, so now we can see the way that we can communicate these details and to have them repeated at the top of every page as the page header. All right, now we can get to work on the body of this report. In the body, of course, I want to display a grid of columns uh, in the order of the order lines themselves. So on the insert ribbon, I'll then introduce to you the way that we can visualize data. There are these groups of data visualizations. Notably, they are graphical uh, visualizations like charts and gauges and spatial representation with maps, data bars, spark lines, and indicators. So to be honest, these are a fairly comprehensive set of visualization types. But I would suggest that if you're going to emphasize a lot of data visualization, think carefully whether Power BI reports are a better option. I would suggest the most compelling reason to use paginated reports are for what we call data regions. Now the big difference and the reason that we group these differently is that a data region is really something you configure as a template. And then according to the data that is retrieved by a data set, that template will inflate to become a grid. And here's the thing. If it's a table, it has fixed columns. And therefore, at design time, we know what the width will be. But we do not know what the height of the table will be because it's governed by the data and the groupings that you configure. All right, and this is where paginated reports excel.
because if that table grows to overflow beyond one page, well, it will simply paginate and deliver across multiple pages. Remember, that was a downfall of the table in a Power BI report. Now, a matrix is characterized by grouping on columns and rows. What this means then is that there's the potential for your matrix to grow horizontally in addition to vertically. All right, that's why a data region is considered different from data visualizations because a data visualization size is static and it is known and configured at design time. So what I'm going to do is right click in the body and I'm going to insert a table. And let me position it at the top left of the body. And uh, when I click any of the cells in the table, let me describe this to you. We get these column guides. All right, so they allow us to multi-select an entire column or to right click and open up context menu options. We also get row guides. And interestingly enough, this icon here with the three lines indicates that it's the detail of your data set. All right, so by default, the template for a table data region comprises three columns. It has a header row and a detail row. And here's a bit of a secret. Every one of these text boxes of there, there are six. They're actually text boxes, right? But they work together to produce a grid layout of your data. So this is how I can quickly and easily configure the data region. By hovering the cursor, what you'll notice is I get this field picker. So all I need to do is choose the line field and the column two will have the product field. Column three will have the quantity. Now I need two more columns. So I simply right click the column guide at the end and I insert a column to the right. Let me create a second one. And then I bring in the fields for price and for sales. Simple as that. Notice the automatic behavior whereupon static text was put inside the header text box based on the name of the field. Now I can change that if I want. It's just text in a text box. But what about this here? Why is line in square brackets? Well, it's actually a shortcut. When I open up the expression editor, what we'll see is that that is the shortcut meaning that it is the value of the line field that will be displayed in that text box. Interesting. Well, let's see through a preview what our report now looks like. All right, now interesting. We can already see here on the run ribbon tab that there are five pages to this report. I'll admit it's not the most beautiful looking report at this stage, but remember we have pixel perfect capabilities and I'll address them soon. I'm going to suggest that the table header could be you know, differently formatted to stand out and to be obvious. We could use a larger font, we could use a background color. Um, I think that the line numbers here might look better if they were left justified. Uh, I'm concerned that the product names are so wide that they're actually wrapping. I would prefer we had no wrapping. So let's increase the width of the product column. Uh, I think that the column names for the numeric columns would look better if we write justified them. And then the values for the uh, currency should be currency formatted. All right, let's have a look on page two. Well, here's a problem. Where is our table header? The default behavior is that the table header does not repeat unless you configure it to do so. And then when I go to the very last page, uh, we'll see that there are no totals. So I would like to see a total here and I'd like to see a total here. So let me demonstrate back in design how I'm going to add those stylings and capabilities. And I'm going to start by multi-selecting two text boxes in the detail row of the tablex. I do that by pressing the control key. When I right click the multi-selection, I have an easy ability here on the context menu to add a total. Now what it has really done, by the way, it's added a new row to the tablex that is the footer of the table. And then you'll notice expressions using the sum of the field, producing a summarization, which is the total we need. So all I'm going to do in the first column of that 
footer is just type the word total. And then to apply some formatting, this is very similar to Excel in a way. I can multi-select the row and then using the ribbon commands, I'm going to make that bold. Let me then select the row that is the table header and I'm going to do something like this. Let's put a background color that is green. Let's make the font color white, increase the font size to, I don't know, 14 and even increase the height. Now, having done that, I can also change the vertical alignment so it's centered, all right? And now I've got that style header. I think I wanted the line number to be left justified, so I multi-select the text boxes in that column and I just use left alignment. For the product, this is really easy, just like Excel, I widen that text box so we can avoid wrapping of those longer product names. For quantity, what am I gonna do? Hmm. Let's multi-select the header text boxes and right justify them. And then for these two columns, uh, what should I do here? Actually for quantity, I can apply formatting, like make it numeric with a thousand operator. Now for formatting, and I'm going to show you here that we have a format property on the text box. And if you're familiar with .NET format codes, you'll understand that N2 means numeric using thousand separator to two decimal places. I don't want two decimal places, so I'm just going to put N zero, make it numeric with zero decimal places. And when I multi-select the price and sales columns, the other code that I can use is C2, currency to two decimal places. The other one I like to use is P for percentage. All right, having uh, made those adjustments, control S to save my efforts so far, then I go ahead and run the report. Now what we can see is a much slicker design of this report. And notice that there's only three pages now because I've removed the wrapping on the product column. Page two, we still don't have a header. I'm gonna address that next. And then I come to the last page and there I can see I have my totals. Awesome. All right, putting the table header on other pages is actually a little bit tricky. And I think Microsoft has done a not very good job about allowing you to configure this. The way that it's done is that you need to open up what is known as the advanced mode for your tablex. In advanced mode, what the rows and column groups are doing is revealing um, the structure of the tablex. Now, the table and matrix are actually extremely flexible and powerful data visualizations. They provide you enormous degree of control on how your data will be rendered. What it reveals to us is that there are static elements. Do you see when I've selected that first element that it's highlighting that it's this text box here. And there are these advanced properties for that region of the tablex. This is why I say it's not very good or discoverable. It's actually, just requires me to update the repeat on new page property for one of those static elements to true. I'm gonna turn that advanced mode off, but if we now preview the report, we'll see that page two and page three continue now to show the table header. Awesome. I think I've arrived at pretty much the report design I want, but I must confess the page um, details here are not really sufficient. It's not quite clear what's being communicated here. So I'll use this opportunity to introduce you to the power of expressions. So let me first widen that text box, then open up the expression editor for the text box to reveal that currently it's just returning a global uh, value that is the execution time. Now, something you need to understand about execution time is that it uses the current date time. This is tricky because in Report Builder, you're working locally on your PC. That means the local time of your machine. But remember, the goal is that you will publish this report to the Power BI service, which is a cloud service. And you'll find that all cloud services for consistency don't use local time. There's actually no such thing. They will use Universal Coordinated Time or UTC. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to build up 
a much more interesting expression that says execution time. And then I put UTC in parentheses so that it's quite clear. And I might also want to apply some formatting. So I have a format function here called format date time. And I see that I even have examples, all right, that I could use date format long date. So let me do this, date format long date. And then I'm going to continue the expression by concatenating a space pipe. And then I'm going to put page details in here. So what I have available to me are built-in fields. Go and put the page number in there and continue the expression by putting of and then bringing in the total pages. All right, so these built-in fields allow you not just to bring in page details or execution time, but you can also bring in details like who is the current user that is requesting this. And that can allow you to do custom or per user layout, even apply different security filters on your data based on the user that is requesting that report. It's possible also to determine how the report is being rendered. Is it PDF? Is it PowerPoint? Is it XML? And your report can dynamically adjust according to render choice. All right, now that I've completed that expression, let's preview the report. To see now on the bottom of page one, we have a much more elaborate and uh, descriptive page footer. All right, my work is done. Before I save and publish, there are two considerations. First of all, what am I doing with all of this blank area at the bottom of the tablex? The problem is that that's going to render at the bottom of the report. And this is the reason why sometimes people complain that sometimes the report delivers an extra page at the end with nothing on it. All right, so what I do is I take care to remove that blank space. And remember my report parameter has a default value and I'm going to turn that default off. Now I can save and save as to the Power BI service, whereupon I choose a workspace. Now I pointed out that we need dedicated capacity. The diamond icon that you see here informs me that this is a dedicated capacity. And now I'm going to save this as my sales order demo. When I click save, it is publishing that report to the workspace, whereupon I can now come to that workspace and find that I have a new report and here it is, the sales order demo. Simply by clicking it then, it is now rendering that report in the Power BI service. It wants to know a sales order number. And then on the top right corner, I go ahead and view that report. Beautiful, now I'm in the user experience. I have this ability to export, to view it using page view, navigate between pages, turn on or off the parameters. I could print it using the browser. Now that basically downloads a PDF render and the browser will print. If I have ownership permissions, I can download the RDL document and I can also get these links to embed this paginated report into another experience, maybe like a SharePoint page. Or I could embed it into a web app by using this URL here. And I want you to notice that it also embeds into the URL, you know, the parameterization details. All right, so it's very, very easy through a single URL to embed a report. Okay, given that I have a little more time before we get to some questions, I want to show you how I can flex the muscles of paginated reports to create perhaps a better experience for the user because the complaint that I'm likely to get is, how am I gonna remember sales order numbers for everybody? Wouldn't it be a better design if I first choose the reseller and then you tell me in a drop-down list, what are the orders for that reseller? This design approach is known as cascading parameters. Let me show you how it's done. I am going to add a second data set to this report and it's going to be named DS reseller key. And I'll use the query designer to produce a very simplistic query that is simply a list of resellers based on their reseller key and their reseller name. All right, now the order is the order of reseller key. I would prefer alphabetic 
the query designer doesn't let me do alphabetic sorting, I have to add an order by clause here. Order by the reseller name. So now I have a new data set that consists of these two fields. I then add a new report parameter that is going to be named reseller key. The prompt will be reseller and its data type because reseller key is the value will be integer. Now I come to available values and I can configure a drop down list. The value is the reseller key and the label is the reseller name. And now you'll see the addition of a reseller parameter as a drop down list. Let me position it so it's the first and I'm going to put order number underneath. Now when I run the report, the first thing the user sees is a, an alphabetic list of all of the resellers. But when we select one, we want the order number to be another drop down list that shows me the orders for that selected reseller. And it's relatively straightforward to do by adding a third data set. This will become the DS sales order. And this time I'm going to write the query out, select the distinct sales order number from fact reseller sales. And this is the important part, the where clause that says the reseller key equals, remember the symbol for a query parameter, at reseller key, and then I'm going to order by sales order number in descending order. So the first one in the list will be the latest order delivered by that reseller. So now I have this single field data set. I can now come and edit my sales order number, modify that the available values will use that new data set, and let's see how it now works. You'll notice that the order number is disabled. It is not until I select a reseller that I can then choose an order number and then view the report. That concept is known as cascading parameters. Very, very powerful capability, uh, allowing you know, awesome filtering opportunities for your users to narrow down on what their report needs to deliver. So I'm gonna go ahead and save and republish that report so we have the latest version in the service. And I simply override. And now when I return to the Power BI service and I reopen that report, we now see we have that ability. cascading parameters. All right, the user experience, and we're getting close to question time. Um, I've already just demonstrated to you how we can consume reports. You simply open them in the Power BI service. I will point out to you that you could also open these on a mobile device using the native applications for Android and iOS. Uh, and they can also be embedded into custom applications by developers. So, the delivery topic's very interesting. Here on the top right corner, you can subscribe to a paginated report, and this will allow you to add to an email an attachment. So what's cool about this is you have these rendering options like Word, PowerPoint, Excel, PDF, CSV, and they can be added to the email. You can enter the email addresses here, including if your administrator allows it, it could be, you know, Bill Gates at Microsoft.com, and uh, we can include a subject and a body, and then we come to the frequency of delivery. You could deliver this on a weekly, daily, hourly basis. You could configure the time duration for this. Do we allow the user to actually be granted privileges to access the report directly? Do we give them a link that they can click on the email? And do we embed a preview image of the report for them as well? When I click save, then Power BI will look after that for me and on my scheduled frequency, it will deliver that report attached to an email. That's the delivery concept for paginated reports. Let me then give you 20 compelling reasons to use paginated reports. And this provides a great opportunity to recap what I've already talked about and introduce some other interesting capabilities. Of course, as paginated reports 
do well, they are print ready. When you export to a hard page format like Word or PDF, they're ideal for printing. You have a choice of eight different rendering formats, CSV, XML, PDF, HTML, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and accessible PDF. You have precision layout to the fraction of a centimeter or inch to determine exactly where your data goes. You have dynamic layouts whereupon expressions can be used not just for text box properties, but they can be used for many other properties. For example, conditional formatting is really just an expression assigned to the color property of a text box. If the value is less than 100, it's black. If it's greater than 100, it's red. There's your vb.net skills being used with conditional expressions. You have render specific layout where you can adapt to the rendering choice that the user makes and the per user layout because it's possible to determine who the user is that is making that report request. When you're querying data stores, you will use native queries to query them. So for SQL Server, that is T-SQL. For a Power BI data set, that's MDX or DAX. So if you have skills in writing native queries, then you can craft exactly what you need. Now, if you don't have those skills, you have the support of graphic query designers that let you drag and drop to build up the query result that your report needs. New to paginated reports is the ability to enter data that you can define a static data set, perhaps useful for prototypes and demos. Data integration can be achieved because, you know, in the report builder pane, it is possible to add multiple data sources and you can achieve some integration using some expressions. However, what I would suggest is that if integration is important to you, that your data resides in multiple sources, that might be a reason to start with Power BI Desktop. Use the power of Power Query to integrate that data into a single model that you publish to your workspace to become a data set, and then your paginated report could query that data set using DAX or MDX. Parameterization is an especially strong capability for paginated reports, and I demonstrated report parameters and cascading parameters. Images, they can be embedded, they can be referenced by URL, or they may be retrieved from a database where the binary large object representing your image is retrieved from a query. There is also custom code. So for you developers, in the report property itself, you can define vb.net here, and you can reference uh, practically anything that the .NET framework can do. Working with regular expressions, I think there's even examples of Azure functions being called by a report using vb.net code. Those data regions of table matrix, and there's a list as well, provide a high degree of control on exactly how you lay out your data. Now, by the way, there's some complaints from some of my customers that when they export data from a Power BI visual, it's not in the format or structure that they want it to be. What you could do is just build a paginated report using a Tablix and use it as a mechanism to export data where relevant to your users. Spatial data types that you might have in SQL Server like geometry and geography are natively understood by the map visual in paginated reports. There's one caveat though, because it's a complex data type, it uh, won't work for SQL Server because the data gateway doesn't work with those complex data types. So spatial data types in Azure SQL databases can be rendered directly by your maps, including custom polygons. There is some beautiful modern gauges. I'll let you explore them. Fantastic for laying out KPIs, either on a linear or radial gauge using scales. Um, HTML rendering of text. You know those placeholders that I introduced to you? There's a property here that says, literally interpret the text as HTML that I'm aware that sometimes richly formatted text is actually persisted in the database using markup with HTML. Your paginated report can render them. You can also do mail merge. Dear customer name, by using placeholders, you can build out letters that inject values into those um, letters. There are some interactive features, but remember it's Power BI reports that emphasize interactivity. You can do some interactivity in paginated reports like drill down and drill up and uh, tool tips and column sorting. And lastly, subscriptions, this ability for you to distribute paginated reports as attachments to emails on a scheduled basis. Quick word about migration. 
there is a migration path from SQL Server reporting services to Power BI, but be aware that there are some unsupported features like shared data sources and shared data sets. Now, To Your Rescue is an unsupported RDL migration tool that will convert your reports by embedding shared data sources and data sets into them. It can convert automatically, it can publish automatically for you as well. So take a look at the documentation for this tool to learn how you could uh, easily and quickly migrate your reports from reporting services to Power BI. Um, note that some data sources aren't supported. DB2 is one example, isn't supported currently through Power BI paginated reports. So do take care that it will pass the checks of the feature set supported by Power BI paginated reports. Well, there's a lot to communicate there, and now would be a great time to uh, work through any questions that you have. And when I've worked through the questions, I'm gonna finish up with some resources that might help you learning Power BI paginated reports. Are there any questions? Yes, uh, first, Peter, thanks a lot for a great session and those wonderful and interesting demos. You're welcome. Uh, yes, and I do see a question in the Q&A panel. If you could quickly hover to the Q&A panel, Peter. Uh, it is a fairly I'm going long to struggle question. to find that quickly. Do you want to read the question to me? Okay, sure. Uh, it's a fairly long question. So, uh, hi, in, in generate link feature, uh, bracket services, is this like published to web? Uh, can see an input question mark, can change the parameter query string in quotes, question mark, any special hidden query string parameters, example, full screen, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, so, so uh, in answer to your question, so it's not the same as embedding a Power BI report. Um, so uh, what it will do, so a Power BI report when it's embedded and published to web actually embeds into an iframe. Uh, a paginated report will deliver in the rendering format of your choice. Okay, if you do choose to render it in HTML, then it literally opens up a new web session with an HTML document that is that report. Um, you could embed it into your own iframe, I guess. It is not the same as published to web. Um, okay, so from a sharing technique point of view, it is not the same. Published to web is a publicly accessible report um, that should be reserved for you know, data journalism activities. So what you can do, let me be clear about it, with a paginated report, you have two options. You can embed it um, using the, let me demo here. Uh, we had um, the ability to embed it securely. Why did that just disappear on me? On the file ribbon, we had the ability to get an embed code to put it in a website or portal, okay, versus just a URL that when you click on that URL, it's going to open the report and you know, it could download an Excel file, it could um, open up a web browser uh, window. Okay, so I hope that addresses the question. Um, I will refer you to where you can find deeper explanation through Microsoft documentation in just a moment. Are there any other questions? Uh, so there, are, there aren't any questions right now, uh, but we could just wait for another minute. Uh, meanwhile, I'll put down a couple of links in the chat window uh, for the audience. Uh, kindly uh, do give your feedback about the session and about the overall event uh, in the above links. Well, it, as we wait for other questions, if they're coming, let me wrap up with some valuable resources for you. Noting that the presentation is available, um, I'm not sure where, but as a PDF document, I've handed that off. And if you can get your hands on the PDF document, these links will be easy to click. But there's an FAQ page, which addresses many commonly asked questions. So I would start there. Um, there are some guidance documentation around paginated reports, which um, I'm the author of, by the way. So if you go to Power BI guidance, you will find that there is an entire section dedicated to paginated reports. And you'll find there that there are articles on when to use paginated reports, guidance on data retrieval and image use, comprehensive examples of cascading parameters, how to avoid blank pages, which is a common complaint. And the migration topic is fully documented here with more details about the migration tool. Now, another valuable resource is that uh, I was fortunate to be in Redmond earlier this year and uh, Christopher Finland, who's the program manager for paginated reports, 
Together with Paginated Report Bear, the three of us sat in a studio for the day and we recorded 24 videos, providing a very in-depth discussion about capabilities and demonstrations. Now, one of the biggest takeaways is that we've also published for free a self-study kit that comprises eight hands-on labs that you can do on your own computer. You simply download Power BI Report Builder, download the study kit. You will need a Power BI uh, access, but you don't need Pro and you don't need Premium to complete the lab. So we strongly recommend that if you're interested to learn more about paginated reports, then the free resource available at this link is a great place to get started. Beyond that, if you're looking for more presentation content, I've got a link here to a recent um, conference presentation at the Business Applications Summit. Uh, a quick word about the new licensing of premium per user. This is relevant for paginated reports because there will be, in the future, not far away, the ability to license on an individual basis to support the rendering of paginated reports. So please read more about this uh, through the Microsoft blog. This was just announced recently at the Ignite conference last month. So at that point, I've arrived at the end of what I want to talk about. If there are further questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, so I'll there is one row here to um, remind people about the uh, summit and this uh, yes. discount code. Yes, uh, and Peter, there's one more question from Ajay, uh, which I think you just answered anyway. So he says, hi, can you provide additional details regarding paper user license premium? Yeah, so I did answer that. And so just the Thanks. reminder is we would say, go and check out the blog that answers people's questions around uh, premium per user license. The takeaway for this presentation is to know that it's going to support you with cost-effective paginated reporting once it becomes available in November. Perfect. Uh, so friends, that concludes our session for today. Uh, we will be uh, having another session at uh, 11 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Peter, thanks a lot once again for taking time out of your busy schedule to deliver a wonderful session uh, for the Data Platform Geeks community. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Everybody. Thanks for the opportunity for having me come present today. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Mm -hmm.